Hey guys, Rory here. I decided to switch things up a little bit and include a video portion of this week's post. The good news is, is that I'm going to list all of the books below the video so you don't actually have to watch me ramble on for the next eight minutes to get the information. So, I thought I would spare you that. If you care to persevere, you're welcome to watch the video, which is more or less an exercise in masochism for me. But I do, you know, sort of enjoy doing it. It's good practice for me. That being said, the topic this week is best books of 2013, which means uh, essentially my favorite books of the year. I'm not going to pretend to be a great literary critic or a great interpreter of literary fiction. So this is just what I enjoyed for the year. I happen to know what I'm like. I'm like, I know what I'm like, of course. I also know what I like. And for longtime followers, um, you know that the things I really enjoy tend to be skewed towards the darker side of things. I have no idea why, and it's actually something I've spent a long time wondering about, because why do we like what we like? The only thing I've come up with so far is that I am naturally deficient in moral fiber. Aside from that, I don't know. I don't even know if there's a right answer to it. So, we can all ponder that while I talk about my favorite books of the year. Aside from serving as a warning, what that means is that there will be no books like Eleanor and Park or Life After Life or even something like Bleeding Edge on here. Although I can guarantee you Bleeding Edge will never be on any list that I create. He is not my favorite author. But to get started, the first book also happens to be the only book I don't have a physical copy of, so I can't show you the cover, but it's a good one if you want to go check it out. It is And Sons by David Gilbert. If The Royal Tannenbaums was ever turned into literary fiction about a father and his estranged sons, it would be this novel. Um, it's funny, it's sad, it's like a love letter to New York, it made me nostalgic for that city, and I don't even like New York that much. But uh, probably my favorite part of the novel is that there's this bizarre bit of science fiction right in the middle. You can't miss it, not that you'd want to, but it is a pleasure to stumble across it and just kind of go, what? was that? But good stuff. Next book is The Rathbones by Janice Clark. Um, this novel tells the story of a wealthy family, its decline in the history of the area, limiting all of those things together. Um, it's eerie, it's eccentric, it's a bit bizarre. If Tim Burton and Charles Adams ever got together and collaborated on a book, that was supposed to be a cross between Moby Dick and the Odyssey, it would be exactly this novel, not to get too specific on you. But if it sounds like you might enjoy something like that, I'd highly recommend this book. Uh, it's very underrated. I have seen some complaints about the sheer amount of incest in the book, but don't let it bother you. It's fiction. Have a good time with it. That's its point. Well, not entirely, but you know what I mean. Next up we have in the House Upon the Dirt Between the Lake and the Woods by Matt Bell. Um, the author is very much a fabulist in this novel. It has a bear, a squid, a fingerling, a foundling, all in the tale of the failure of a marriage and fatherhood. It's very much a novel, like The Rathbones actually, about not getting what you want. Um, there's even a wee bit of cannibalism in it. If you've read it, you'll know what I mean. Um, if you haven't read it, you can read it and figure out exactly what I mean by that. It is a good story and worth uh, checking out if you think you can handle it because it is a bit dark and disturbing. Most of the books on this list are now that I'm thinking about it. But next up is Burial Rites by Hannah Kent. This is historical fiction which is not exactly my go-to genre but this novel is so exquisitely written that I thought it deserved a space on this list. Uh, Almost unfairly so, really, because the author is, this is her debut novel, and she's very young. It doesn't seem fair that a person in their 20s can write like this, but lucky for readers, she can, and um, even though it ends badly, you know what it is going in, because it's based on a true event, so you can be prepared. Next up we have... Donnybrook by Frank Bell. Uh, Frank Bell has been filling the void in my life left by Donald Ray Pollock since he seemingly has disappeared off the face of the earth. This is the story of a three-day boxing match in the middle of a cornfield in the middle of nowhere. Uh, 
there's drugs, drinking, sex, violence, blood, uh, almost anything offensive you can think of, it is in this novel, but it's also wonderfully written. So if you get a chance to check it out, I would highly recommend you do so. It's probably my favorite novel of 2013, though that might depend on the day you ask me. But I think that one would win most of the time. Next up we have The Good Lord Bird by James McBride. This one is this year's National Book Award winner. Uh, I was actually quite proud of myself, I know it's silly, that I read it before it was even long listed for the prize. But um, it's a story of abolitionist John Brown, and uh, so obviously it's Civil War era. The dialogue and the dialect in it are brilliant. It's very Twain-esque, so if you enjoy him, I think you'll enjoy this one as well. If I could think of just one word to describe this one, it would be irreverent, so you know it works well for me. But I think this one has fairly um, wide appeal. Also, um, I think it's really neat that James McBride was a member of the Rock Bottom Remainders. I never got to see them perform, which is sad, but I think it would have been amazing to see all those authors up there playing, even if uh, the music wasn't exactly spectacular. So, check it out if you get a chance. And next up we have uh, Nosferatu by Joe Hill. This is a genre-bending masterpiece, which is good because I legitimately offered my pinky finger to William Morrow, the publisher of this, in exchange for an advanced review copy. I am still embarrassed that I actually wrote that in the email. Um, they still gave me a copy, so thank you, William Morrow, if you're reading this. I don't think I will ever live that down myself, even if nobody else knows. But, um, if you can't guess what it's about, given the title, just go ahead and Google it. It's, this book has more puns than I could count, which for me is wonderful. I do love a good pun. But my favorite part might be the fact that it presents librarians as the all-knowing gatekeepers to the answers to the universe, and I will not argue with that assessment. Brilliant man, brilliant author, brilliant opinions. He's right. Um, I always trust a librarian. Do I not look trustworthy to you? But next up we have Dirty Love by Andre Dubias III. Um, there's something you can't trust me on. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing the author's name right. Um, that's how my professor in college said it, so I say it the same way. But this novel is a big box of misery wrapped in a big bow of despair. So depressing as all hell. But it is also beautifully written, so if you're so inclined to be sad for a week or so after finishing a book, I would read this one. If not, there's eight others to choose from on this list. Finally, we have Double Feature by Owen King. Um, if you like B-movies the way I do, and you like good family drama, which who doesn't love that, I would read this one. It's very funny, it's very witty, and it just so happens um, that the author is a Red Sox fan, as am I, and he makes his main character a Red Sox fan as well. So it's just about perfect, if you ask me. But that's all I have. Nine books that I loved this year. I hope you'll check one or two of them out. If not, thanks for watching this whole thing. Um, and for longtime readers, thanks for following along. I really appreciate it. I love you guys more than you know, almost embarrassingly so. But I also want to say happy reading and happy and safe New Year's.